Hi everybody, Rick here and uh, uh, here at the ranch and I am with our new uh, dealer relations and customer service um, extraordinary Isaac and uh, I'm not going to say your last name Isaac because uh, believe me my name is sometimes bad but what is it? Helter Bridal. Yeah, you see, you guys got that, right? So anyway, <clears throat> we brought Isaac on um, probably what, a couple months ago? Mm -hmm. September. A couple, three months ago, something like that. And um, he's doing a great job with, he's the uh, the guy that a lot of you guys talk to and you email into customer service. And um, we were we were kind of, uh, we started, we decided to start to do a, a, a series of videos and we're going to kind of call it, um, Behind the scenes at RHK, or RHK behind the scenes, or Rick and Rick behind the scenes, but you kind of get it. It's it's uh, um, a lot of uh, we. Uh, I started thinking about this because um, this is our my 35th year of making knives, and um, 35 years in the business is at the at the long time. You're you weren't even born yet. Yeah. Sam wasn't even born yet. So, in fact, a lot of you guys probably weren't born yet when I started making knives. So, across those 35 years, a lot of, uh, a lot of things happened, of course. I went from making um, uh, art knives, Damascus, and uh, you know, forging knives into production knives. Um, I joined the fire department in the mid to late 90s. I think it was 97. I joined the volunteer fire department, and that actually changed quite a bit of uh, my um, what I thought about knives, and because I started using knives in a in a sense of uh, I mean art knives. Every knife I made was to be used, obviously. But uh, when I got into the fire department, I found uh, other it was obviously serious uses for a knife, uh, especially a folding knife um, that really kind of shaped. Uh, where I went in my knife making and knife designing and we're going to touch on that on a lot of these videos because there's a lot of things that I came up with um, that are kind of standard in the industry now that I'm very proud of of the fact that um, a lot of other knife makers and knife companies seem to value of, of uh, some of these things that I came up with and um, and push and I, I feel push the industry forward or made knives more uh, more useful um, uh, I don't know you know taking things forward you know make them a little bit better than they were way back when and 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 that's a tall that's a tall task because knives are man's oldest tool so um, you know to actually take it in and improve on man's oldest tool that's a tall order and uh, and I feel um, and it's been uh, industry-wide appreciation for some of these things and we're going to talk about that on our first video today yep. and it's uh, the other reason why we're doing this is because guys I got a I got a, a great team here at Rick Hinder Knives and uh, a young team so which is good uh, it, it's great to have a, a, a very enthusiastic uh, young group of people here uh, but it's also, you guys weren't around, obviously, you weren't even born yet, when some of these things um, I developed. And so I get a lot of, I got a lot of questions in the shop from, uh, you know, from my, my uh, employees, my associates on, well, why is this this way? And, and why do you have this? And where did you come up with that? How did you come up with that? And, you know, I... I take it for granted because I, I came up with it. I know, you know, and, and when, I'm, when I'm working with uh, everybody in assembly, when we're working through new builds and stuff and I'm explaining to them, well, this is the reason why this works that way because I engineered it to work that way. And, and uh, if it came right out of my head, then I'm the one, I, I'm the one that knows more obviously about the in, intricacy, intricities of that then, uh, and, and then I pass that knowledge on to them. And, for you guys, especially you, Isaac, and customer service, when you're answering these questions, to understand more of why I came up with the with the, uh, the LBS, the lock bar stabilizer, yep. you know, and and um, and so instead of me just telling you and telling Sam, we decided to do a video because I'm sure a lot of you folks are probably wondering the same thing. So. 
Um, with that, it's going to be kind of like an interview. So, so uh, uh, Isaac, you, you went online and got some questions? Yeah, we posted on the Instagram story asking uh, for people to submit some questions. And we got a couple here that are between people online and then some people here at the shop. Okay, fantastic, fantastic. So that's how the format we're going to kind of uh, take it. I, I like the yak. So <laughs> it'll, probably be a, it'll probably be a lot of me yakking. Um, but uh, uh, hopefully it, we'll be able to answer you know, some of those questions and, uh, and probably go into even more questions. Um, and, and maybe off topic. You know how I like to go off topic. Yeah, maybe a little bit. So, so go ahead uh, again. Well, let's, let's, let's talk. So the, the, the lock bar stabilizer. Uh, and I think your first question is going to be. Um, when was the LBS created? When was it created? When did I come up with that? Mm -hmm. Well, there's there's a couple, uh, and I believe, I know I, I looked this up the one time of when I actually, I put a post on the forum, the Usual Suspect Network, when I very first came up with the lock bar stabilizer, and and I came up with it to create an issue that I, uh, that I found. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it was, I believe I should have done my homework before the interview, uh, before the video, but I, I believe it was 2003, 2004 maybe, uh, when I came up with it, because it came, the lock bar stabilizer came from um, kind of a call out I had when I was on the fire department. Uh, I had used my knife and I went to, and I had, you know, turnout coat on and everything, and I had turnout gloves on, and I went to close the the lock and this is and this is the uh, um, on a frame lock or mono lock it was it's and and I tell you what kudos to Chris Reeve Chris Reeve is the is the one that is credited for coming up with the idea of taking a a a, a, lar, a, a thicker bar of titanium and making that the whole lock instead of like a liner lock where you have a liner and a handle and uh, Chris Reeve came up with that and uh, and I have to ask Tim I can't remember if he called it a mono lock or a frame lock or what, what he had, had called it. But, um, you know, kudos to Chris and tip my hat to a, a fantastic design at the, the, uh, uh, the frame lock style. A lot of knife makers and companies have used it. And that was the, uh, that was the knife. I believe it was a, a uh, either an Inferno or a fire tack that I was using that day when, um, when this happened. But I was, uh, I went to, to close the knife which means you take and you take your lock, uh, your lock, your hand, and you push the, yep. push it over. Well, when you're, especially when you have heavy turnout gloves on, they're very heavy gloves, and and throw in a little bit of adrenaline, mm -hmm. you know. And what I did was I overextended the lock, and and it was at, at that point it was no good. The, the blade was just free swinging. So obviously there's some issues with that. Um, Number one, uh, you, you, the, the blade is just free swinging and you got a live blade, and especially, you know, um, in a situation where you have you know, other people around, so if you don't want that to happen. So, so anyway, so I was like, hmm, this is a problem. And a lot of inventions come out of necessity, as yes. we know. So I was like, okay, I'm going to fix that problem of overextending the, the lock. But there was another issue that I wanted to uh, address. And this was something that uh, myself actually and, and Ken Ungan talked about, and it was the uh, uh, vertical uh, flexion of the lock bar. And what that is is when on a on a frame lock style knife like this. So what you what you have is you have this you have this cutout that you cut into the, and that of course uh, we do it with a water jet. Um, way back when I first started, I did it with the end mill. Uh, so I took a uh, 1 16th end mill and I, I milled that out. Well, that's a, that's a 1 16th slot in there. And what I'm talking about is vertical flexion is when you grip a frame lock really tight and when you're working with it really hard, this will actually flex up that way. And uh, you, can, you can kind of feel it. Now, it takes a lot, but it was still something that I really didn't want to have happen. I wanted to stabilize that lock bar. Mm -hmm. 
And so that was the other and really important uh, reason for the lock bar stabilizer. And that's why it's called the Hinder lock bar stabilizer and not an over travel stop. Right. There's two different things there. There are over travel stops out there that do a great job with preventing that, uh, the, the over travel of the lock outward. But uh, what mine does in addition to that is it, it prevents that, that movement uh, vertically. So, uh, so that, was, that was the premise of what I wanted to fix, mm -hmm. uh, what I wanted to improve upon. So uh, at that point it was, uh, okay, how, you know, how do I do that? Just, you know, so I started looking, I started looking at, and uh, the first thing that came to mind, I, I believe it was like a square and that didn't work. And then so immediately I went to a round button and um, there's, there's, a, uh, there's a method to the madness, so to speak. Um, I know a lot, a lot of you notice that the, the button overhangs the lock bar and there's a pocket milled in there. Um, but there's, it's, that's not completely, you know, there's, there's a, there's a, uh, uh, like where you put it and, and things like that to kind of go into it. What was the first knife that you put it in? And I, I, I believe it was, it was either the fire attack or an inferno. Uh, I made a knife called inferno back then that I carried a lot when I was on the fire department. So it may have been the inferno, but Honestly, and we're going back a little ways. <laughs> um, honestly, it was probably the fire attack, um, the early fire attack. Because I've I've seen some examples of my early early fire attack that I have the lock bar stabilizer on, and gotcha. and uh, that's uh, I imagine that was probably the first ones that I did. Gotcha. And you mentioned you tried out a square, and then you moved to the circle with the button style. Um, and that was actually another question: is how many variations? Uh, was um, that was, I guess there would have been two. So it, it was, uh, uh, I remember the very, like the very first one, you know, the first day. Mm -hmm. I was like, yeah, that, that ain't gonna work. <laughs> and there was a reason, it, it worked as an over travel stop, mm -hmm. but I, again, I wanted it to be a, a stabilizer. I wanted to stabilize the lock bar. Yeah, makes sense. So. Yeah, um, so along with all that and the design, uh, Another question was, what made you decide to put the lock bar stabilizer in the middle of the lock bar? Which is, as we talk, we kind of talked about a little bit before off camera, that's not exactly in the middle. It's kind of more towards uh, the bottom. It's kind of more obvious, maybe on the right. XM24. Um, but people were curious what the advantages of that would be. Well, the and and and, and you're correct. This the spacing, the spacing of the of the stabilizer, and this actually this is one of the first knives that had the lock bar stabilizer, mm -hmm. um, and it's a, it's a fire attack, and uh, it actually it's one of the old style uh, lock bar stabilizers that has my name in it. Uh, Which we had a question. So about those are they're well. highly collectible yeah. now. Um, so and you can see uh, even with the clip on, you can see the relationship of where the lock bar stabilizer is in the in the uh, in the lock bar and the reason for that is you could put the lock bar stabilizer any in any position on the lock bar to for it to act as a over travel stop but if you wanted to also uh, do the job of stabilizing that lock bar you have to have it at this is about one third on the, from the, the 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 back end of the start of the lock Gotcha. And what that does is, is it enables, if you can see that, I don't know, if Sam, if you can be able to, you can see that the lock bar stabilizer is actually still in contact with the lock bar. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that way if there's any kind of movement upwards, it's being, it's being stopped by the lock bar stabilizer. So if you move that stabilizer button up here, it's not going to be in contact with the lock bar anymore. That makes sense. So that's the reason why a lot of over travel stops work great as an over travel stop, but they don't actually stabilize the lock bar. Uh, and that's why having the placement of where you put the lock bar stabilizer is actually crucial as to if you want it. Now some some knife makers maybe not that may not be a, a, a big issue for them, um, but uh, that's something that I always wanted. So that's the reason why you see on all these, they're pretty much on the back end. Yeah. And so, uh, you know, because of that. That makes sense. Kind of along with that, um, another question we had was, so you talked about the placement, but they're curious about the size and then the placement of the cutout in the lock bar. 
Does that change where and how the over travel stop needs to be implemented? Um, the 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 uh, actually the size and the and the placement. So the size is going to dictate. I mean, you, these are about three eighths in diameter. Um, can you put a half inch diameter and do the same thing? You probably could, uh, but then it looks kind of gaudy and big big thing on mm -hmm. a knife. So that's more of a design thing. It, it's it, you're still going to be able to uh, achieve what you need to achieve. It's just a different a different look. Yeah. Um, but again, where where it goes on the lock uh, on the lock is is crucial yeah. if you want it to act as a stabilizer. Gotcha. And I think a lot of I think a lot of people out there, and this is why this video is really good. They think that the the uh, the hinder lock bar stabilizer is a over travel stop, but it's actually much more than just an over travel stop. Yes. Yeah, makes sense. So another question we had is with the introduction of the lock bar insert on mm -hmm. our newest not, uh, models, people are curious if the LBS still functions exactly the same way and has all the same features as it did pre-lock bar insert. Yes, absolutely, and this is the really cool thing. So, and a lot of, a lot of people when I, when I did a lock bar insert, they're like, well, why do you need the, the lock bar stabilizer when your, your lock insert does the same thing? Mm -hmm. It doesn't do the same thing. That's yeah. why if, if it was just an over travel stop, they're absolutely correct. Because of the fact that we have the, the uh, uh, what we call the lock puck, uh, we have that insert overhanging the frame of the knife. So uh, even without the lock bar stabilizer, you can't overextend the lock bar because of the, of the, uh, of the uh, lock puck. Uh, however, it does not do what? It doesn't stabilize it. Exactly. Yeah. So the stabilizer, the lock bar stabilizer, still does its job in stabilizing the lock bar. Perfect. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah, yeah. And then going back to what you said on here, people are curious. Will we be able to see those again? The uh, the original ones. Yeah. Um, you know something? Probably not. And, and the reason is is because they're they're kind of like um, the unicorn. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, in all collecting circles. There's got to be something, just like uh, the uh, uh, Hellfire grind. Mm -hmm. The Hell, Hellfire grind will never be done in a production. It will only be done on a, in a custom uh, when I grind them. Um, can we do them in a production? Absolutely. But, you know, for the collectors out there to have that pride in owning something that's so rare. I'm a collector of all kinds of, you know, things. So yeah. I know that, that, that rarity thing. And... If we were to make a thousand of the original, you know, okay, where's the that unicorn? Like, oh, I found an original Lockbird stabilizer. You know, yeah. that's kind of gone. Yeah. You know, so uh, I think right now, I think I think I'm gonna leave it like the Hellfire Blade. Uh, it's it's you Makes know, because I know myself when I see one of my knives out there in the marketplace, and first thing I'm like, oh wow, it's got the original. How cool! Because yeah. Lori actually made some of them. Very cool. So that was some of the stuff that she did, you know, back when she was working in a shop. So it's, it's kind of like a little bit of history, too. Yeah. How long ago has it been since you stopped doing those? Oh, my gosh. You you probably, uh, you yeah, you were still saying gaga. Yeah, <laughs> probably. Uh, uh, honestly, that, oh, I, yeah, that was probably 2006, maybe. Yeah. Um, and the reason why... The reason why she started uh, making them is because, and we'll go into our next thing, is, is uh, uh, the, first, the first company or knife maker that licensed the Hinder Lock Bar Stabilizer was Strider Knives. And um, Mick Strider contacted me about uh, incorporating it on their uh, SMF and, and uh, SNG and, and uh, you know, and I thought, you know, I mean, Strider's a good, you know, he's a good friend of mine. Yeah. And, and I'm like, yeah, sure, that'd be, that'd be kind of cool. So, uh, and I said, I'll tell you what, I said, I'll make them for you. And uh, so uh, we, we started making them, and <laughs> I'm like, okay, it is quite a fit. Uh, hey, Lori, can you help me with this? <laughs> you know, so what's really cool is, is also when I see a lot of Strider knives out there with the Hinder Lock Bar Stabilizer, and it has, it says Hinder on it. You know, and those are original. Those are the exact same stabilizer buttons that I used on my knives, yep. and uh, and Lori made a lot of those. And and uh, you know, and I, I talked to, to Mick uh, about it when 
when uh, when we were talking about it, and I said, hey, I said um, that, yeah, let's do that. But, you know, I, I came up with it. So if you don't mind, I'd like to have my name on it. Yep. And he was uh, uh, he was like, oh, yeah, yeah, no problem. Heck, yeah, that'd be great. You know, and, and uh, so that was the first licensing of the of the interlock wire stabilizer, and and uh, and since then um, we've had I've had a lot of uh, a lot of different companies, uh, including uh, obviously you have Gerber, uh, Kershaw that I've designed for um, that have used utilized the uh, interlock wire stabilizer. Um, my first international company that uh, that we had a license with was um, uh, Lion Steel. And uh, Giovanni, or Gianni, I'm sorry, Gianni came to me about uh, doing uh, a licensing on their version of it, which is a little bit different, but kind of the same concept. Right. And uh, and yeah, a lot of a lot of other uh, you know uh, great great companies, uh, uh, Spartan Blades, mm -hmm. you know the guys at Spartan Blade, and and Medford, uh, Medford Tool and Die is using uh, the lock bar stabilizer across. Uh, a lot of their yeah. uh, frame lock knives, so it's it's uh, it, it's really cool to see something that that uh, that I came up with um, years ago, yes. uh, being used by a lot of different companies to uh, obviously to help and improve their their frame lock design, and and it's 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 been a great ride on that. Yeah, that's fantastic. So. Um, Let's talk a little bit about the uh, uh, the differences. I know I see all these out here, and there's a copper one, there's a stainless one, a, a, uh, a brass one, yep. maybe a titanium one in there. So uh, the one thing about the lock bar stabilizer too is it, it creates a little bit. You can see some of the different. It creates more of the uh, um, um, make it your own. Yep. You know you can get a lock bar stabilizer from us, and and uh, and we've had some steel flame. Lock bar stabilizers that were actually uh, shells. You know, um, I think he was using 45 ACP shells or something, and, and they're making them to put in to act like a, a as a button. So, cool. um, so yeah, it's, it also it, it helps uh, guys do that, make yeah. it your own. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, did we get to the? Uh, hopefully, we uh, answered yeah, uh, we'll everybody's see. questions yeah. that and maybe uh, enlightened some of the uh, the hinder knives fans out there on um, a very important part, every one of the, the knives and your knives that you get, as far as the uh, folders, the frame locks, um, have the, the lock bar stabilizer. So hopefully those of you that are uh, watching this will be able to understand when you get, you're looking at your inner knife, you're like, now I know what this does. Yeah. And it's not just something on the side of the knife. and. And, and also uh, the impact, I think the impact that the interlock bar stabilizer has had on the industry as a whole. And, and uh, like I said, I'm, I'm, I'm humbled beyond words. It's something that I came up with, and, you know, way back when. And I, I remember the night I was actually in the fire station when I, uh, when I actually came up with the concept of, of where to put it on the, and I was just like, Oh my gosh, Epiphany! It's it, yep. it's it's so cool, and then we have a squad call. But anyway, um, so yeah, after all those years of uh, of that uh, that initial concept, uh, it's on uh, you know obviously all of our knives and a lot of other knives out there, and and uh, uh, appreciate you guys watching. Um, this is Isaac. What first? Well, first video for us. Yep. So we're gonna get Sam on here too. So he's not gonna be completely uh, <clears throat> left out of it. And, um, uh, but anyway, there's going to be some more videos because there's a lot of other things that, uh, uh, that I've come up with over the years. And as we celebrate my 35 years of making knives and, uh, <clears throat> and celebrate 35 more years. That's right. Holy shit. That's like 70 years. <laughs> yeah, maybe, maybe not 35 more, <laughs> but, uh, but anyway, uh, it's a great ride and, and I'm looking forward to, uh, Keep it going. Yeah, absolutely. Thank All you. right, guys. Hey, thanks a lot for listening, and uh, we'll see you on the next one.